a pastor who thought she was cursed. For me, it was waiting. When are you going to answer me about this? What caused this? And I got nothing. Hear how she got the answer she was looking for. Plus, a male model and a Hollywood cast-off look for a fresh start. Find out how their desperation brought them together on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. This month, the Canadian Supreme Court dealt a blow to religious freedom. The overwhelming majority on that court ruled that law societies can deny accreditation to Trinity Western University. Why the denial? Because of the community covenant signed by the faculty, staff, and students. The covenant says, according to the Bible, sexual intimacy is reserved for marriage between one man and one woman and within that marriage bond, it's God's intention that it be enjoyed as a means for marital intimacy and procreation. Well, the court ruled that the law societies uh, had struck a proper balance in denying accreditation between religious freedom and the public interest in preventing discrimination based on sexual orientation. Ray Pennings, the head of the Christian think tank, Carta, said, Institutions ought to have the right to define aspirations that come out of deeply held values and to live them consistently in community. That's what a pluralist society looks like. And I totally agree with this. This is something where you um, uh, come on Canada. If, if a community of people can't say, we want to regulate our sexual behavior and only have sex in marriage as defined by the Bible, well then uh, they ought to be able to do that. They ought to be able to say our behavior uh, can be self-regulated within our community and we agree in covenant uh, to adhere to that community standard of behavior. Um, this is not discriminatory. This is a group saying we want to live a certain way in accordance with precepts set down in the Bible they ought to have a right to be able to do that. Well, here's a story that should leave you feeling good about police. Roger was a stuffed animal cheetah and just happened to be the best friend of four-year-old Will. Will accidentally dropped the cheetah out of his parents' window while traveling along Interstate 95 in Rhode Island. Well, the family turned around but couldn't find Roger, much to Will's sadness. So Will decided to write a letter to the police. It said, I lost my Roger. Can you please find him? I love him. Well, Will included a drawing of Roger, and a few months later, a package arrived from the Rhode Island State Police, including a letter to Will. It read, we spent days looking for Roger on the highway. We couldn't find him. We did find another cheetah walking around the highway. He said he was looking for a new home in the Big Apple, and we thought of you. Will's mom was moved by the kindness shown to her son instantaneous reaction of, oh, I told you not to do that. I knew he was going to fly out the window. It's so refreshing to have something like this happen that just reminds you that there are really good people out there. And sometimes when you're not looking, there are always wonderful humans who are just ready to do right by someone, a pure stranger. We just wanted to find him one and uh, make him feel happy. Oh, that's a wonderful thing. Yay for the police. Well, these days, couples are spending nearly twice as much as they did on weddings 10 years ago. That's just 10 years ago. It's a trend some money experts and even pastors are finding troubling. Heather Sells breaks down the reasons why an expensive wedding may not be the best way to start a marriage. For most brides, it starts with this. Thousands of pictures and ideas to help plan the perfect wedding. It's definitely a lot of pressure. Corey Bateman got married last summer and says she was well aware of the challenge in meeting expectations set by social media. I think weddings are just a much bigger deal than they ever used to be. It's not as much as, oh, it's two people getting married. It's what kind of party are you going to throw? And Bateman isn't alone in her feelings. More than one third of couples feel pressure from the media to have that perfect wedding. It may be why the average bride and groom spend $28,000 compared to just $16,000 10 years ago. Or why they delay walking down the aisle. I am seeing engagements being greatly prolonged. I'm seeing people searching for the perfect venue, for the perfect time of year, for the perfect colors. 
Pastor Benjamin Verbacek has written about the pressures couples face to create what he calls the Pinterest dream wedding. It's a theme that other pastors have picked up on as well. The goal, help Christian couples refocus and think about the ultimate purpose of their wedding and marriage. So culturally, I think right now we're at a place where um, our identity is not so much looking um, upward to God and who He says we are in the gospel, the good news that we're, we're His sons and daughters uh, in Christ, but, but rather who we posture ourselves as in social media. And research helps back up the idea of a frugal wedding. Economists have found couples going the $20,000 or more route divorce more than those who spend less than 10000 If you want to go big, social scientists recommend going with more family and friends, not necessarily more money. They believe it can increase your chance of a happy marriage. Sociologist Brad Wilcox calls it the big fat Greek wedding factor. So having your wedding, you know, in you know, a relatively cheap venue, maybe a church hall, for instance, or something else, but with a lot of your friends and family members there seems to be the formula uh, when it comes to the ceremony itself for greater marital quality. Nikki Crystal and her fiance followed this so-called formula without knowing it existed. I am one of five. My mom is one of six. Most of my family lives close by, and so I grew up with just a lot of people around, and I, can't, I couldn't imagine having something small. Crystal, however, also faced a tight budget. My parents helped a lot, and they helped where they could, uh, but I also didn't want to be in debt after I got married. So the couple cut corners. They picked a cheap venue, hired a photographer for just half a day, and bought wholesale flowers. That kind of thrifty thinking also inspired Casey Capra, who says her mom taught her about stewardship. Together, they made table centerpieces and other decorations. There was a lot of satisfaction in looking back at things you had created and done and known that you hadn't even spent a lot of money on it. For their large wedding, Corey Bateman and her fiance used their network of friends and family to help keep costs down while creating memories. Thanks to volunteers, they didn't have to hire musicians, a florist, or a wedding planner. Even after the whole day, I had people say to me, we really loved how your wedding was just so family oriented. I was like, well, what do you mean by that? I'm like, well, we just, you know, everyone was involved. It just seemed like there were a lot of people that care about you guys that helped and that um, were having, you know, just a great time and wanted to be a part. That community support, says Wilcox, can extend beyond the wedding day and help the couple weather the seasons of life. In the meantime, Pastor Benjamin is committed to help steer couples away from the Pinterest perfect event. I think they're relieved to have someone telling them, hey, don't, you don't have to make it about these things. You don't, the value of your wedding is not on how much you spent on it or how many people you know, post on Instagram at, during the reception. The value is, is that you love each other, that God loves you, and it was a, a Christian wedding. Heather Sells, CBN News. And that kind of value will last a lifetime. When you put that value on the wedding to say, this isn't about social media, this isn't about extravagance, uh, this is about building a family and, and having that community of family come alongside to say, we bless it. Uh, if, if the average cost is $28,000, that, that's a lot of money. And, uh, that would be probably better spent as a down payment on a home. Well, up next, she was diagnosed with cancer. Find out why she thought she was cursed and how she was miraculously healed. That's up right after this. Joy, peace, and freedom. Those are the three words Maybelline uses to describe how she's feeling today. But it wasn't always like that. Just a few, few years ago, she was diagnosed with aggressive cancer, and the disease wasn't just taking a physical toll. Maybelline Sturvident had biopsies before, but this time she was called into the doctor's office when her test results came back. The doctor just walked up to me and he says, I'm just gonna be blunt with you. I'm just gonna tell you, you have cancer and it's malignant. And he said, I'm gonna send you over to an oncologist and then you'll have to go to surgery. How in the world did this turn into cancer? Maybelline's aggressive stage three malignancy required chemotherapy, radiation, a mastectomy, and reconstructive surgery. Her pain grew into anguish. 
I was dealing with the fact that it, it may come back again or what, am I, what did I do? Am I being punished for something that I don't even know what I did? It was a bit of torment, not knowing what I had done or what could have caused this. As a pastor and bishop, Maybelline faced the unanswered questions together with her congregation. I never stopped ministering. I never stopped coming to church. I attended even when I wasn't preaching, unless it was, you know, too bad that I couldn't get there. I figure if the Lord is doing this with me, it wasn't death. It was just a season of trial. The enduring trial of uncertainty and silence lasted nearly a year. Watching television and the preachers preaching and hearing about God's healing and deliverance. And uh, for me, it was waiting. When are you gonna answer me about this? What caused this? Am I cursed? And I got nothing. Until April 19th, 2016, while in pain and watching TV. I saw Gordon Robinson that night. Uh, God knows how to use people to get his word to us. You've got cancer, and God wants to assure you right now, he's able to heal you. You've been trying to figure it out. You're looking, what did I do wrong? You're looking, is this some kind of curse that's come on me? All of that was me. He had exact words that, that I had put before the Lord, and I knew that was God. God just wants to, to wipe all that away, and he wants to deliver you from this cancer and heal you completely. You're in pain right now. The sign for you is this pain is going to leave you immediately. The pain just left. I was able to turn over and sleep something I hadn't been able to do since the surgery. Peace. I just cried because he heard me. Maybelline's pain is still gone. They asked me, did I need any more medication for my pain? And I, nope, I don't. I don't need any. They assumed that I would need some. He just healed my hope. It was restored to know that God, as big as he is, looked down upon me and said, I got you. And because of Jesus, my soul as well, therefore my body can be completely healed. I can wait for him no matter what comes. I'm content and I can wait. I didn't know Maybelline, but God did. He knew exactly how to talk to her, how to encourage her, how to show her that he wanted to take all that pain away. When did he do that? When, when did God take all the pain away? When you get this fact down, uh, then it makes faith very easy. And he bore it all away 2,000 years ago. Jesus took on himself every single disease, every infirmity, every pain. He took it all 2,000 years ago. Along with that, he took every single sin, and he took it to the cross, and there it died with him. And then the great news, three days later, he rose again. And the sin is no more. The pain is no more. The infirmity is no more. He took care of it for all people for all time. And it happened 2,000 years ago. And the great news, Jesus is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. What he did 2,000 years ago, he is doing today. It still works. The blood will never lose its power. Now, let me pray for you right now, and let's just believe God. When the Bible talks about prayer, it, it's always a very encouraging thing. Here's one of the encouraging things. When two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done. So let's agree together and realize there's no time or distance in the Spirit. What Jesus did is still effective today. It will reach you where you are. He wants to come to you. You don't have to convince him of it. You don't have to beg him for it. You don't have to bargain for it. You just have to believe it. So let's believe and let Jesus do all the rest. Pray with me. Lord God, we just reach out to you knowing that you are reaching out to us and that you are reaching right now into people's lives, their homes, and their bodies. And as we reach out together and we touch that infirmity, we agree regarding it. We say to it, laying hands on it, 
be healed and be made whole. And Jesus, we know that you're joining in with this prayer now. And we're believing you. We're believing in your sacrifice. We're believing in the stripes of Jesus Christ. So stretch forth your hand to do wonders and miracles now. Command the blessing, command the miracle, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to act your faith, what you couldn't do before. Do now. If you couldn't move your neck, if you got a pain in your neck, just move your neck around and realize that pain is gone. If you couldn't move your arms, if you couldn't move your legs, if you couldn't stand, do what you couldn't do before and receive it. We have prayed. God has answered. You are healed. Stand on that healing now. And we're here for, to pray for you. If, you. if you need prayer, we believe in that prevailing prayer that, that doesn't give up, that says, I'm going to contend. I'm going to fight the good fight of faith. I'm going to contend for my healing. We're here for you. 1-800-700-7000. Well, up next, he grew up in a Christian home, but traded his faith for modeling success. Everybody there loved me, loved the way I looked, loved the way I dressed, loved the way I talked. I mean, everything was just, oh, you know, Will is awesome. Find out why Will says that life was empty and where he now finds purpose. Don't go away. Renee was an actress who believed sex was the answer for everything. Will was a model who would sleep with anyone to get what he wanted, and the two were living their dreams. But then the next day, they were desperately miserable. Trying to get high, smoking a lot of weed. It was just about, okay, Will needs to have a good time because Will needs to numb this pain totally thirsty for unconditional love, and no one wants anything to do with me. I had no self-worth at all. Will was an addict who couldn't relieve his guilt. Renee was a Hollywood cast-off, desperate for someone to love. Both came to LA looking for a fresh start. Their desperation brought them together. Renee was adopted and raised in a broken home. As the only Middle Eastern girl in small town Kentucky, she never felt like she belonged. Everyone was blonde, blue eyes, had dimples, had like little button noses. Like just looked like little Britney Spearses everywhere, okay? I felt like I had to be beautiful and I felt like I wasn't beautiful at all. I told myself, as long as you have a banging hot body, you're set. It doesn't matter if people love you because you can get that void filled by sleeping with somebody. I just felt like sex could fix everything. Will was a different story. He was a pastor's son, had a loving family, and was a devoted Christian. He started preaching at 13, earning the admiration of those around him. But by college, it was more about the attention than the message. My relationship with God was really dwindling because I was strictly going through the motions the kudos and the recognition. It feels good being able to brag to my buddies that, oh yeah, I got invited to go here. And, yep, going out of town again, you know. Sorry, I can't hang out. Then Will got a job that boosted his ego even more as a store model at Abercrombie and Fitch. Everybody there loved me, loved the way I looked, loved the way I dressed, loved the way I talked. I mean, everything was just, oh, Will is awesome. And all it was was pride. Will started pulling away from his church and eventually left the ministry to work in the fashion industry. As for Renee, she had moved to Hollywood with dreams of becoming an actress. Within a few months, she starred in a national commercial with Jessica Simpson, booked guest spots on Desperate Housewives and Ugly Betty, and even received a personal invitation to the Playboy Mansion. I had basically gotten everything that I had ever wanted handed to me. But I still wasn't happy. I just wanted some kind of unconditional love. I wanted someone who just found me to be the most amazing person in the world. It was then she started dating a well-known actor 
and moved in with him. But it was not the fairy tale she had been hoping for. He cheated on me. He would go drink and do drugs and end up in the hospital and then call me from the hospital and say, I drove him to do that. But I just wanted to be loved so bad, I didn't care. Meanwhile, Will signed with an agency in New York City and was modeling for Armani, Puma, Bloomingdale's, Emporia, and Gucci. I felt like I had arrived, people were awesome, I loved them, they loved me. But success came with compromises and a growing sense of guilt he couldn't shake. I was doing all these things that were wrong, going against everything I was taught. I was willing to sleep with whoever. I was willing to do any kind of drugs. I still had these moments where I felt like it was just me and God in the room. And he was just, what are you doing? What are you doing, Will? While Will's career flourished, Renee's was about to crash. A sex tape she made with her boyfriend was leaked to the tabloids, destroying her professional and personal life. It was my idea to make the tape. It was my decision to make that, but I was doing it to try to fix our relationship and try to like help somebody like love me. And, um, and it like ruined my life. <laughs> I couldn't get a job at this point. No guy wanted to be with me at all. That is until she met Will. After having a falling out with a designer, Will headed to LA hoping to restart his career. The night he arrived, he met Renee at a party. It was a perfect fit. He needed a place to stay and she needed someone to love. He's willing to live with me. He's willing to be with me. So I'll just put up with the fact that he does drugs because who else am I gonna get that loves me? But the drugs Will used to numb his guilt were costing him his career. After three months, he had no money, no work, and no one to turn to, except God. I said, God, I'm, I'm done. I don't know if you still love me. I don't know if you still have something for me. I just know that I can't continue doing what I'm doing right now. I just wanted to be in church because it had been years since I'd really been in church. I remember going up to the altar and praying as much effort and energy that I exerted for myself, that's exactly how much I want to give back to you. You're my heavenly father, and I'm like a prodigal son. Gradually, Will stopped using drugs, but Renee noticed that wasn't the only thing different about him. He started to have a lot softer heart. He started to not be so angry. He started to be kinder with me. Then. He did something that made Renee's heart stop. He said, we're not going to live together anymore. And we're not going to sleep together. And I was like, no, 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 <laughs> no. No, dude, no. If you stop sleeping with me, you will want nothing to do with me. I, trust me, I know. And he's like, look, I'm going to show you that we will still date. We will still be together. I will still be faithful to you. And he like still called me. He still like took me out on dates and he really showed me like what true unconditional love was of like, you don't have to sleep with somebody. You don't have to live with them. You can be faithful to them. That was just like a total depiction of Jesus. And I felt like, like, I just like really, like he really showed me God. A few months later, Renee gave her life to Christ. Two years later, she married Will. It was then she realized that God had given her the love she had always wanted. Genesis 50, 20, what evil was planned against me, God used for good. And it's just like really cool because <laughs> that's something like only he could do. In 2015, they launched The Night Shepherd, an organization that provides legitimate resources and personal support to those working in the entertainment industry. Together, they share how God fully redeemed their lives. I have found my identity in the Lord, that He made me perfect in every flaw and every freckle and everything is perfect in His eyes. There's no room for pride and God. And God says, it's not about your works. It's about what I've done. It's not about your accomplishment, but it's what I have 
set for you. And his awesome plan is better than anything that you could ever come up with. Unfortunately, Will and Renee's story, I think, is all too common in today's hookup culture, that you somehow think that sex will bring love and bring worth, or, um, and it never works out that way. And at the end of it, you're wondering, well, where do I go? What do I do? Well, I've got great news from you. you. You can always come home. You can always turn to God. He won't reject you. He will receive you with open arms, and he'll do that again and again and again. He never runs out of love for you. Never. You can find him. You can have a relationship with him. You can have a hope and a purpose with him. And it's a wonderful adventure if you just say yes to it and allow him to turn you around, change you from your innermost being, make you brand new, and he will do that every single morning if you just let him. If you want this, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the phone, make a phone call, 1-800-700-7000. Just tell the person who answers that call, I need to find Jesus, and I need to find him today. We're not here to judge, we're not here to condemn, we're here to tell you God loves you and He has a purpose for you. Here's a word from Romans, therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God.